With nearly 3 million people now fully vaccinated in Massachusetts and more than 4 million, or nearly 60 percent of the population, expected by the beginning of next month, the state is moving forward on the next stop on the road to normalcy. Beginning today, amusement parks, theme parks can reopen for the first time since the pandemic began with up to 50 percent capacity. Road races and other large outdoor athletic events and medium and high risk sports tournaments, whatever that means, can resume with safety precautions. Stadiums, arenas and ballparks can now go up to 25 percent capacity. Indoor singing performances can resume and stores are no longer required to set aside dedicated senior hours. Though Boston is delaying most of these rollbacks for at least three weeks, not including the stadium and arena capacity increases, which did take effect today. Nationwide, nearly 115 million, that's close to 35 percent of the population, has been vaccinated and counting. And later this week, the FDA is expected to give emergency authorization to some children for some children to get the Pfizer COVID shot. The efficacy of the vaccine in 12 to 15 years old was essentially 100 percent, and it was really quite safe. Then you work your way downward from 12 to 9 years old, 9 to 6 years old, 6 to 2 years old. Authorization for kids of all ages could come as soon as early next year. It's all a source of hope for many, but public health experts are warning we may never be rid of COVID-19 altogether. And so far, the pandemic has taken a massive toll with close to 580,000 deaths from the virus in this country just so far. One of them was Donald Reed Herring, the oldest brother of Senator Elizabeth Warren, who died last April at 86 years old. Their relationship is chronicled in their latest book, where she delves into sexual harassment by a former boss, a different set of rules on the campaign trail, and her relentless push for a more caring, supportive government. The book is called Persist. Senator Warren joined me the other day to discuss. Senator Warren, it's good to see you as always. Thank you. Good to be with you. So you're not the only one who could have written a book called Persist. I would argue that so too could scores of your colleagues, 70 percent of Republicans who persist in saying this election was stolen last November. How does democracy survive with this toxic lie hanging over everything? You know, it's not just a toxic lie hanging over everything. It's now that Donald Trump and the Republican leadership are requiring people to actually bend a knee and repeat the words of the lie. Uh, mm. This is poisonous to our democracy. It truly undermines everything that a full and fair democracy stands for, that you get out, you vote, you do your best. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. I actually know about that. And then we accept the will of the people and we move on. We do what we can to help this nation and we get ready for the next battle. But we don't in this case. Yeah. 93% voting record with Trump was not enough for Liz Cheney to keep her position in her party. So how does this how, how do we continue like this? You know, I think right now that the way we continue is that we do the things the nation needs and wants. So think of it this way. Um, in the last year, there has been so much turmoil and change. We've had a pandemic, a, a, a reckoning on race, uh, an armed insurrection a president who won by more than 7 million votes, a mm -hmm. record. And we turned around and passed a the most uh, ambitious, most progressive rescue plan in American history, and it was widely popular. Joe Biden stood up and declared it was a bipartisan bill mm -hmm because it was helpful to and supported by Democrats, independents, and Republicans. In other words, in that sense, you just bypass the Republicans who are so out of touch in Washington. Well, we'll talk in a minute about whether or not that will be the, both the first and the last, but I want to talk about your book. I want to warn you, sure. I like policy almost as much as you do. 
But the part of your book that has stayed with me so far has been the personal. Let's go through a, f a couple of these things. You talk about being on the campaign trail, encountering people saying, but Martha lost, Martha Coakley, <laughs> but Hillary lost. You go on to say one of the reasons your campaign faltered, you didn't attach a way to pay for Medicare for all. Well, Bernie Sanders didn't attach one either. But you refuse to say that sexism is part of what brought you down. You just say I wasn't good enough. Why don't you say what to me is you making a textbook case that sexism was a part of this? Look, I give an honest account of the questions I was asked, the things that were said. Uh, the reports that were made at the time. That's my job, is to document that. But as you know, because you've read the book, what I care about is the change we're going to make going forward. What I want to see is I want to see us pass universal child care. I want to see us cancel student loan debt. I want to see us put a wealth tax in place. I want to see us do these things that are actually popular across this country and needed across this country. I'm going Senator, to record Senator. what's happened, but I'm going to stay in the fight for the future. Okay, fine. But I want to talk about the past because you do too. When someone said to you, but Martha lost, but Hillary mm -hmm. lost, what did you say to yourself? Well, as, as, as I said in the book, I sometimes wondered if any of the male candidates got a question like that. After all, Al Gore lost, uh, Hubert Humphrey lost, and yet nobody <laughs> said, can a man actually win? But this is what persistence is about. I'd say, uh-huh, and then I would say, here's what I'm going to fight for. Because what you really have to show is, I'm not going to fold. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to give back in this fight, because this fight was never about me. This fight is about the people I'm fighting for, the ideas I'm fighting for, the policies that would actually change lives. And I can't give up. I just can't. I got to persist. I, I know that. But, but you told these stories for a reason, not just mm -hmm. for it to be memoir-like, but to make a point about going forward. You talk about being at the University of Houston Law Center, being yeah. sexually harassed. You continued to, and uh, uh, by a guy who had a lot of authority over your work and your career. You continued to work with him. You stayed in touch with him afterwards. You even spoke at his funeral. In uh -huh. retrospect, do you regret having done that, or was it unavoidable in those times? No, uh, I tell the story in part to explain what it's like to be there in the moment. What it was like when he chase me around the table, what it was like to be afraid for my job, not just that job, but my career forever. As I make clear in the book, that's what's really on the line. This was the man that was the head of the group that hired me, the committee that hired me. And once I got hired, he became the head of the committee that would determine my tenure and whether or not I would be able to stay in teaching. This wasn't about sex. I make that very clear. It's about mm -hmm, power. And that that power reinforced itself over and over. Yeah, I got out of his office the next day, but uh, that night, but I didn't know what would happen the next day and the next week and the next month and the next year. And every time I changed jobs, someone would tell me, oh, yeah. And we called him and he gave us a recommendation, told us about your teaching mm -hmm. and so on. It's a reminder that that power structure still crunches around women. He used to call me and just out of the blue. Um, and he always called me. I always knew it was him because the first word out of his mouth would be she wolf. That's what he always called me. And um, through the years, I got where my heart would settle down. And one day he called and said he was dying. And he wanted me to speak at his funeral. And I told him, no, I was not going to do that. And he kept insisting. He said, no, I want you to speak at my funeral. And I said, if I do, I'm going to tell what happened. And he laughed. Do it. And that's what I did. I stood up and I told the story and I laughed about the story and made it clear. He had no power over me anymore. And, and that's how I see it. I tell that story mm -hmm. for women, for some men, 
who may see themselves in that circumstance someday. Um, it is about power, and we will persist. We will fight back. I'm going to get to policy in a second. Just one more story that has really stayed with me, and that's about your brother, Don Reed Herring, yeah. a rock rib Republican military guy. I love when you say that he thought everything that he saw on Fox News was truthful. What was the one exception to that? <laughs> the things Fox News said about me. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, he I don't know if you ever heard Carl. Except that. I don't know if you ever heard Carl Bernstein uh, say, and he said repeatedly, that he thought that Donald Trump's behavior in terms of how he handled COVID-19 was homicidal. And yeah. I agree with that. Do you? I do. I do. Um, people died in this country because our nation had no plan for dealing with COVID. When the crisis was upon us, uh, Donald Trump was not even there to make sure that we got masks and oxygen distributed. Mm -hmm. He was not there to put a plan in place to help save our people. On the day my brother died, Donald Trump was complaining about the restrictions from COVID meant that he couldn't play golf, that the golf courses were closed. His failure to put a plan in place, his failure to indicate even the slightest human mm. concern for the people who were sick and dying resulted in the deaths of thousands and thousands and thousands of Americans. And my brother may have been one of them. Senator, uh, here is you speaking at the Democratic National Convention last summer. We build infrastructure like roads and bridges and communication systems so that people can work. That infrastructure helps us all because it keeps our economy going. It's time to recognize that childcare is part of the basic infrastructure of this nation. It's infrastructure for families. Obviously, the White House got that message big time. I think it's fair to say that uh, Joe Biden's agenda could be transformational. But I also think it's fair to say that in many respects, Joe Biden's agenda is Warren light. Uh, <laughs> is it not true that you think he's bold but not being bold enough? Uh, look, he had he stood up a couple of weeks ago, addressed the nation and talked about child care as infrastructure. That is bold. He said he wants to put $425 billion commitment from this country into child care and early childhood education. He needs $700 billion. I'm going to keep pulling for that because we really need to make this universal, high quality, lift the wages of every child care worker and preschool teacher. But it's very much in the right direction. My job is to pull it all the way there. Well, but 700 versus 425, he's in a different yeah. place on health care. He wants to tax the wealthy, but he doesn't include a wealth tax. He wants to forgive $10,000 in student debt. You think 50000 is critical. You do believe he's got a long way to go, do you not? I believe he's taken the first step, and that is acknowledging that we need child care, we need to cancel student loans, we need to raise taxes on the wealthy. I just think he needs to come a little further on that. And that's what I'm going to keep arguing for. And it's a part of why I wrote this book, Jim. It's about pulling more people into the fight, putting more wind in the sails. Look, what Joe Biden is doing is meeting the moment. And the more that we make clear as a nation the kind of change we want, the more that Joe Biden is going to get us there. That's that's what it's going to take. But Joe Biden, Senator, Joe Biden can't get us there unilaterally. You may believe uh, there's a dispute, I know, between you and the president as to whether or not he can unilaterally do the student loan stuff. Much on your agenda, much of, about what you speak at some length in the book, the policy prescriptions you care about require congressional approval. 50 votes is going to be hard enough in the Senate. 60 on virtually everything is unreachable. I know you support eliminating the filibuster. Joe Biden is un apparently, at least as of the moment, does not. How do you get to the promised land on any of these things if Biden and Senator Manchin don't move on the filibuster? 
Look, some things we can do through reconciliation, some things we may decide to do through an exception. We got to protect voting, protect democracy, and we may get people to come along on that, uh, even if they're not willing to get rid of the filibuster overall, but understand this. The filibuster has to go. Um, look, our, our founders looked at the question of whether or not we should ha require a supermajority in the House or the Senate in order to pass legislation. And they decided, yeah, you need it for some things. You want to pass a treaty. Uh, you want to impeach a president. You need a supermajority. But for everything else, simple majority. House and Senate. That was the design from the beginning. Filibuster was used for a long time in order to advance racist policies, to prevent us from passing things like anti-lynching laws. We cannot, as Democrats, give Mitch McConnell a veto over every single thing we're trying to get done. Look at what just happened. We passed a rescue package that is popular across the nation. Democrats have to deliver on their promises. And if that means dump the filibuster, then we're going to have to do that. But we must deliver. We made promises in 2018, in 2020, and in 2021 in Georgia. We need to keep our promises. Senator Warren, that's a hell of a room you're sitting in wherever it is. Happy Mother's Day. It's good to see you. Thank you. It's good to see you too, Jim.